a Kenyan diplomat that had said, you know, every time a Chinese ambassador comes, you know, they leave with, um, you know, we, we get a hospital at the end of that visit. Every time like a British you know, ambassador comes or a leader comes, we, they leave us with a lecture. So I think, you know, just showing yeah. these two titles says a lot about the perspective. Okay, you can call it transactional, but also many countries in the world are thinking about how to improve the conditions and the material realities of their people, because that's important about governance. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. According to U.S. politicians, military leaders, and the media, everything China does on the international stage is viewed as some sort of underhanded attempt to weaken the U.S. They describe China's foreign policy as increasingly assertive, aggressively expansionist, hawkish, transactional. The Belt and Road Initiative, that's not China just doing business. It's China aggressively expanding its diplomatic and economic outreach to supplant U.S. leadership. BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Council, that's not China trying to build economic power with other global South countries. It's an intentional threat to replace the U.S. as the world superpower. Brokering peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran? That's not China acting as a responsible force for stability in a volatile region, no. But rather, it's China making the U.S. look bad. I mean, if Xi Jinping sneezes, it's somehow a scheme to take down America. It's true that China is becoming more assertive diplomatically, but is the U.S. interpretation for why true? Or is it projection and delusion? And how does it relate to China's internationalist past? What does it mean for the future of the global South and the world order? To help us understand, I'm joined by Ting's Chak, a researcher at the Tricontinental Institute and a member of the Dengsheng News Collective. But before we jump into it, this is just the first half of this episode. The second half is available for Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Tings, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Rania. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure from our end. I love having you on. And you know, you and I actually, since the last time I had you on, we got the chance to meet in person finally, which was awesome. Yeah. Even though it was like already, like I basically knew you because we've done a show together a million times. Um, but now here we are again, uh, virtually. And I think this is a really important topic because so much seems to have changed in the world. I mean, I feel like I say this in every episode I do now because the world has changed and shifted so much in just the last few months. And a part of that huge shift, especially, you know, being for me being back in the Middle East, is all of the various peace deals that have been made, uh, which, you know, the ma most, I think, important one between Saudi Arabia and Iran was all, was overseen by China. And that was a very big deal. China has been doing a lot more on the international stage. I mean, they've even been playing a role with potentially trying to act as at some point some sort of mediator between Ukraine and Russia and sort of positioning themselves there. Um and the U.S. is, of course, freaking out about all this. And we see all these articles in the mainstream from U.S. outlets. We hear American politicians complain about it. We hear American military leaders complain about it. Um, and I think there is something to be said that maybe at least from what I've noticed in the last, I don't know, like couple of years, especially the last year and a half or so, Chinese diplomats have, in fact, become a bit more assertive in their rhetoric. And then you do see China playing sort of like these global roles on the world stage that are really important. So this kind of brings me back to like, I remember there was this wolf warrior diplomacy that we heard about a couple of years ago. So I guess let's start there. Like what is this wolf warrior diplomacy? And is that a part of some of the things I mentioned and what we're seeing with China sort of making its international presence bigger? Right. Um, I think it's an important kind of kind of recent historical look back. You know, I think I agree with you totally. It seems like history is moving at leaps and bounds. You know, Lenin once says that there are sometimes decades where nothing happens and there's sometimes weeks that decades happen in, or something like that. But I think yeah. we are living in that moment. Um, so I would like to say that I think the shift in tone of on the diplomatic stage of China has been coming for a few years. And of course, the West likes to call it wolf 
warrior, democ uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, which of course has its own sort of tinges of whatever you want to call it, if it's racism or xenophobia, when a country wants to stand up for itself or also stand up for just the weaker, more oppressed nations of the world. And I think we saw this biggest shift in that uh, Alaska meeting, if you remember, Rania, mm -hmm. between Anthony Blinken and the former head of the foreign ministry, uh, Yang Jiechi, who was talking about, um, you know, it was the first meeting in a long time. Um, and, and he had those strong words to say that the U.S., and I'm quoting here, doesn't represent the majority of the countries of the world. And the rules made by a few people cannot serve as a basis for an international order. So in this sense, I think it's really clear that China has been raising its voice uh, against real, I think, real provocations, real uh, increases in uh, aggressions led by the U.S., not only against China, but against many countries in the world. I mean, something like 30 percent of the countries in the world have some form of sanctions against them, most of the time unilateral by the U.S. And so in a way, I think the, the voice of China isn't about replacing the hegemony of the U.S. on this diplomatic stage, but really is this challenge of the so-called international order that the U.S. has led since the World War II and has really been uh, a unilateral voice since, since the fall of the Soviet Union over 30 years ago. Um, but we've also seen kind of this repeated, this kind of tone repeated amongst uh, a lot of the foreign ministries, um, members, spokespeople, uh, Wang Yi, uh, recently one of the China's top official, uh, uh, called some of the responses by the U.S. Um, with really strong words, calling it absurd and hysterical. Um, and really taking a stance, I think, and, and a lot of Chinese people are quite proud of not being sort of stomped uh, on without some kind of, you know, uh, uh, response by by the, the key figures of Chinese diplomacy. But we're also seeing this amongst the ambassadors and other figures who are on the social media platforms, particularly the Western ones. Um, but I think one of the things to put in here is this idea of diplomacy. It's not just about contestation of, of the U.S. rhetoric, but it's also around this role you, you started with is this increasing role in brokering peace uh, and playing a diplomatic role in the real sense, not just in the rhetorical sense. And of course, the Saudi-Iran uh, um, rapprochement is, is historic. Um, and I think it was quite interesting to see as a kind of um, a show of good faith uh, with the recent um, crisis in Sudan, Saudi Arabia also facilitated the evacu uh, evacuation of Iranian um, citizens uh, along with the Saudi uh, citizens. Um, and of course, we're seeing that now um, uh, possible uh, role that China will play with Ukraine conflict, with the war in Ukraine, um, most recently with the Xi and Zelensky call that was quite historic as well. Um, and I think in that call, uh, unfortunately, I don't think it was highlighted as much in the Western media, was uh, Xi's strong words that he used as saying, as a UN Security Council permanent member and a responsible power, we will neither watch uh, the fire from the shore, nor add fuel to the fire, let alone take advantage of the opportunity to make profits, which of course is a is a criticism of the U.S. war machine and how that has been fueling uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Indeed, yeah, that is like a perfect description of what the U.S. is doing. Um, and I mean, those are all such such important points in terms of just what's happened, like you said, in the last few months. Um, and I'll even say, I mean, it, you know, being in in Lebanon. The impact of Saudi and Iran having this rapprochement is so, it impacts the entire region, right? The U.S. has played this really dominant role in kind of using Saudi Arabia as a weapon throughout the region to carry out its own foreign policy goals, which end up leading to a lot of chaos and destruction um, that plays out in so many countries. And now, you know, you you even see Saudi sort of tampering its down, down what it does in Lebanon. I mean, it's always kind of played this really negative role in Lebanon, uh, where it supports various groups to stoke chaos and, 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 and destruction and cause fighting. And now some of the people who Saudi Arabia usually backs here are kind of upset because now there's like not a reason to if you're OK with Iran, at least at the moment. Um, but all that said, I mean, I think this also points to a certain past, right? Like in some ways, and I don't want to overemphasize it, but in the past, China was this very internationalist country. Um, especially like when it first became a communist country under Mao and for several decades after, uh, really, I think it maybe until it normalized with the U.S., um, played a really instrumental role around the world in liberation struggles and supporting various anti-colonial causes and having like a, 
affinity for other socialist countries. Can you maybe give us a brief overview of like past Chinese internationalism and then maybe why China had to step back from that at some point? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I, I'm glad you raised this with this historical context um, of China's internationalism or relationships with the global south or what was termed the third world in, in the Mao period and really is part of the socialist internationalism. When China at the time was a very, very poor and just burgeoning um, um, young socialist society. And we, we have strong linkages um, and have historically had so. Let's look at the Tazara Railway being one of the, I think, flagship projects of international solidarity. At the time, Zambia was a, is, is a landlocked country and was surrounded by the colonial uh, white majority uh, countries around it and didn't have access to the seaports. So China in the 1970s just celebrated 50 years anniversary of the construction, created um, this railway providing an interest-free free loan. Remember, in the 1970s, China was still an extremely poor country. Um, and 56,000 Chinese workers actually worked alongside African workers to build hundreds of build bridges, a nearly 2,000-kilometer-long railway. And it was important because this was for, not, for the country to uh, assert its own uh, sovereignty and not have to be dependent on the colonial states around it. And actually several dozen, actually about 60 Chinese um, workers died in that process. And I'm naming this because I think it gives a historical um, understanding of when we look at, you know, and I think a lot of the Western pundits will often uh, frown upon um, this idea of importance of infrastructure for the national sovereignty of many countries in the global south. That is continuing since the um, liberation struggles of an earlier part of the 20th century. So now we're seeing uh, China has emerged uh, as the second largest economy. This was, of course, as you mentioned, the rapprochement period. In the 70s, China kind of struck a deal to be able to develop its productive forces and opening up its market and integrating into the world economy and also being able to learn from the technology, from uh, attract the capital from the West in order to be able to develop the country into the second largest economy today. But now it's a large and strong country and it has a different role to play uh, in the world and in its relations with the global south. And it's much more than I think a lot of the symbolic solidarity that China could provide as a as a poor socialist country in the Mao era. I mean, I talked about the Tazara, but a lot of the solidarity was also symbolic solidarity with countries that are seeking their independence. Um, and now we're seeing that, I think, in the context of, you know, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative, which we can talk more in depth about, um, but also the kind of variety of infrastructure, uh, financing, uh, and trade agreements that, that China has struck with um, most countries in the global south at this point. I mean, for a continent like Africa that has a, a, a deficit of infrastructure at $110 billion a year, where basically 40,000 um, 40% 40, 40 of its residents don't have access to electricity, the question of infrastructure and this continuation of sort of cooperation and technology transfer and investment from China is really key to be able to move the countries forward in the direction um, that they choose to move forward in. Yeah, and I definitely want to get to those specific things that you mentioned, like the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and some of the ways that the Americans frame how they view it, as well as other sort of like cooperative economic blocks, whether we're talking about like BRICS, or, which is a big deal, or maybe like the Shanghai Cooperation Council. But before we get to all of that, I want to like talk a little bit about, okay, so like China kind of, you know, has this rapprochement with the US, takes this sort of like, I don't want to say break, but is more focused on developing internally for a few decades. Uh, and it does a really good job doing so. I mean, you, you and I did an entire episode on how China managed to alleviate extreme poverty, which I encourage people to go check out. I can also link to it in the description of this episode. Um, but obviously, China focused on developing. It focused on alleviating poverty and giving people access to things and just really internal stuff. China is this massive country. And then, you know, time passes and we reach a different point in time, I would say like I and this is this is me maybe answering my own question, but then I want to get your take on it. And that is, you know, why is China so much more engaged diplomatically and on the international stage today? And I guess I'm curious about the significance of certain events uh, and, and sort of pushing China to, to sort of come out and and make bigger moves internationally. And here I'm thinking of things like, you know, the significance of the 2008 economic crash. Um, 
I personally think that, you know, the U S spent a lot of the early two thousands and then mid 2000, you know, and then like, you know, from 2003 to 2011, causing so much conflict in the Middle East. I mean, we know for a fact that from, you know, whether it's the Iraq invasion of 2003 or whether we're talking about NATO and Libya or what the U.S. did in Syria, really destabilizing that country, these bigger countries like Russia and China, this was kind of like the last straw for them. They're just like, enough. This is so much destruction. You're destabilizing these countries and it's actually destabilizing the world because it's causing all these like really crazy groups that you're supporting in these countries to like commit terrorist attacks in our countries in our neighboring countries. Uh, and, you know, China and Russia did play a major role, I would say, especially during Libya and, and Syria specifically, not even Libya, Syria specifically, and using their UN Security Council vetoes to prevent a no-fly zone, which would have been devastating and would have led to like ISIS taking over Syria. And then of course there's the war in Afghanistan. And I know I just mentioned a lot of things, but I guess I'll go back to my basic question was, yeah, yeah, like why is China so much more engaged today in 2023, both diplomatically and economically than it was 20 years ago? What what changed? I mean, I think uh, I think it's important you putting these two things together, the 2008 economic crash, as well as the myriad wars and invasions that the U.S. has led in the last 20 years. Um, I think starting with the first part, 2008 was a huge marker, I think, of the decline of the U.S. hegemony. Uh, and, and its capacities uh, as a country to sort of lead the so-called international order. Um, and, and a global South countries with China in the lead needed new platforms and possibilities. And we see the emergence of BRICS um, and BRI and also the strengthening of other multilateral uh, and regional platforms because you know, to be honest, the, the the model that the US had led and it was wor worsened by the credit crunch of 2008 was no longer viable, was exhausted for the pathway for many of the countries. So that left a kind of vacuum. And not only in the economic sense, but I think they left a kind of political, moral vacuum in the sense of the loss, decline of credibility in the U.S. model, let's call it the U.S. model, or the sort of model that it has proposed uh, for the, the development of the global south under the neoliberal regime of the IMF or World Bank. And we know that well of what that is characterized by, right? It's about flexibilization, privatization, structural adjustment. And that system was exhausted. It did not seem to serve the needs of the people in global south countries. Um, and at the same time, the U.S. hasn't had a very good track record since then in serving um, the, the needs of its own people. Um, and so in that sense, it left a sort of political, moral vacuum as well as an economic vacuum. You know, the U.S. Uh, 20 years ago uh, was the top trading partner of 80 percent of the world's countries. Uh, and now it basically has completely shifted towards China. So many countries have gone towards China for their trading partner, but also to access financing, uh, access financing through uh, the BRI, for example. So um, I think in that sense, that was important. And when you talk about the wars, I think we can look at one specific example. I don't think we can go into all of them. Is, is Afghanistan, you know, a country that um, uh, suffered an invasion of 20 years, uh, which costs $2 trillion of the U.S. taxpayers' money and hundreds of thousands of lives, and of course, mostly Afghani lives. And what does a, a country like Afghanistan coming out of these 20 years have as an option, you know? And so China actually has been playing a really big role, um, specifically in the sort of humanitarian, also the reconstruction process since then. Um, China's sharing a 90 kilometer border uh, with Afghanistan. Uh, China's already the largest investor uh, in, in the country. Um, but in recent uh, months and weeks, we've seen some important kind of steps that, uh, that China has been doing. For example, uh, the invitation of Afghanistan to join the BRI. Um, and, and an extension through a $60 billion uh, investment to uh, build, uh, extend the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or the um, CPEC, to Afghanistan, which will be huge in terms of connecting the region. Um, and as you mentioned just briefly on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in the region of, of South Asia and Central Asia, this has been an important um, pl platform, for, especially in regions that have faced a lot of instability, as you mentioned. Um, Afghanistan is one of the nine countries that are in it, uh, but it also is, includes six of its neighbors. Um, this has been a platform established in 2001 uh, between China and the Central Asian countries. It now represents 60 percent 
of the Eurasian territory and um, about a quarter of the world's GDP and 40% of the world population. So this is way larger when you're talking about uh, pr proportion of the people, but almost in terms of the wealth uh, as the G7 country. So it is really a massive uh, platform where you can talk about things like security. How do you deal with the instability is generating? How do you deal with terrorism, extremism, and separatism? Uh, and, and as a political platform, as a kind of lever um, against, you know, the kind of G7, the US-led West, and having another platform for countries to be able to assert its own agenda and its interests. And I think it's quite interesting, you know, at the end of um, the COVID three years here, Xi's uh, first visit was was for this SCO heads of state meeting in Uzbekistan in Samarkand. And we're seeing from that Samarkand moment, which is coincidentally also where she announced the BRI project 10 years ago, really carried on the spirit, I think, of this co solidarity cooperation uh, in the spirit of, you know, the Bandung Conference of 1955, the idea of mutual non-interference, non-aggression and coexistence. So I think it is an exciting moment as um, to provide another alternative, given the sort of political, economic uh, uh, and moral vacuum that has been created by the U.S. It's so I mean, it's so interesting when you put something like the Belt and Brody in initiative that way, um, because, you know, I just want to reference there was this like CENTCOM testimony, I think it was by a CENTCOM commander, uh, where he's going over all the strategic threats. And like one of the main strategic threats is Iran. Another one is Russia. And then another one is China. And the testimony about China um, is basically all about the various ways, like everything that China does diplomatically or economically is viewed through this by the United States is viewed through this lens of they are trying to take our position in the world order. They're trying to supplant us as the superpower. They even use that language. Here's this guy's testimony. I'm just gonna read specifically about Belt and Road. He says, the Belt and Road Initiative remains a strategic lever to supplant US leadership in the region. I mean, referring to the CENTCOM area, like the Middle East and stuff. Uh, initiative remains a strategic lever to supplant US leadership in the region under the guise of benign economic initiatives and broadening security relationships. And he also goes on to accuse China of aggressively expanding its diplomatic and economic outreach again across the region. So like this is the kind of language that the US, at least military commanders, and of course like politicians reiterate this sort of thing. And then because US media just basically repeats whatever they say, we see this sort of language in US media, but it's constantly like, you know, you just described Belt and Road Initiative in a very cooperative like language um, of like mutual economic benefit, whereas the U.S. sees it as like China's just driven by wanting to take over our role in doing business in these countries. And I'm just curious how you respond to that. No, I think it's it's really interesting, let's say, to watch the fragility of U.S. imperialism in this moment and this like identity crisis. It's 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 almost humorous reading that CENTCOM. And thanks for sharing that with me, um, because there's a sense I think we it's repeated in the mainstream Western media of the U.S. losing Africa, of losing Latin America, of losing the global south. Uh, I think recently I saw a Bloomberg article and the title was something like the global south owes America some thanks and yeah. that the rule-based order that the U.S. has created has been favorable for the development and these countries are just not thankful, you know, how dare they? And then I think there was some like byline uh, that was like, it is the world that the U.S. built just good for the West, but bad for the wet rest. And it's like, I think, I think the rest of the world is saying, yeah, we didn't get a good end of our deal. And we're kind of really happy that there's another option after basically since, you know, Second World War, and especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, there hasn't been any other options. Oh, thanks. You yeah, pulled yeah, that yeah. up. I put the article on screen just so people know you didn't make that up. That actually yeah. happened. <laughs> Like this guy, Hal Brand really wrote this article for Bloomberg. And I'm going to just repeat the title again, because it is amazing. The Global South owes America some thanks, with the subheading being the rules-based order crafted after World War II has been favorable, transformative even, for the developing world. I mean, that's that's certainly one way to put it. But anyways, please continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks for pulling that up. So then, you know, cite my sources. <laughs> but... but... One of the things 
I think is, you know, I think in that same CENTCOM report is also using this language of like, oh, China is being so aggressive, you know, in its diplomacy, including um, helping to uh, create this rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I think it's very hard for anyone of any political stripe to say that that is an aggressive maneuver when we're trying to broker more peace in the world. I mean, that's just, no matter what you think about any of the parties involved, that just is ridiculous when you see those words next to each other. So anyways, I think I think countries um, in the global south are responding um, by by their actions and, and, and responding by choose, uh, who they're choosing to align with and who they're choosing to not align with and who they're choosing to uh, broker uh, their own uh, agreements with based on their own conditions. And I think it's about time we ended with this sort of paternalistic attitude by the U.S. and the former colonial powers to say that, you know, basically we don't know what our actions are and that we are all going to be duped by China uh, because, um, I don't know, they just know the U.S. <laughs> path. <laughs> well, China like, has some sort of hypnotic impact on people, I guess. And just for those who are wondering, like this report, the CENCOM, it, was not, it wasn't a report, it was testimony by General Michael Eric Carrilla on the posture of U.S. Central Command. This was delivered to uh, the Armed Services Committee uh, back in mid-March. And then for those who aren't familiar, because I don't want to just assume everybody knows CENTCOM is a part of the U.S. military because the U.S. military covers the globe because America is an empire. Um, CENTCOM is covers like the central area of the globe, which means like the area between Europe, Africa and Indo-Pacific commands is what it says. But it's basically like the Middle East, I believe, North Africa. I mean, then I mean, Africa has AFRICOM, but I guess certain parts of North Africa would be covered under this and uh, other areas like near Afghanistan and those parts of like the Indo-Pacific. But the point is, is that there's also like, we, there's also something called Southcom and there's also like a Europecom or something or Euro, I forget what it's called. But literally the US has these different commands uh, that cover different parts of the world. And so this was specifically referring to Ch what they view as Chinese threats to that particular area of the globe. But I imagine there's probably constant testimony. You could probably find something similar from Southcom about, I think South Conf maybe covers Latin America, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But the point yeah. is, is this is a constant theme throughout the way the US military in particular, the way the Pentagon views, uh, views China, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or whether it's even like the Saudi Iran deal, like they view everything in terms of like China literally trying to take over America's role in the world, which is funny to me because that is not China's goal. Like, I don't think China really wants that role. Even it's just trying to like be a world power because it is and engage with other countries in a mutually beneficial way, uh, as you're explaining. But, you know, I think another um, event, another historic event that has probably pushed China to to be to, to, as the U.S. would say, become more aggressively diplomatic. I love aggressively diplomatic as if diplomacy is a bad thing. But to become more assertive, at least diplomatically, has been the war in Ukraine. I mean, the U.S. is also throughout this war as it's pouring all these weapons into Ukraine and openly saying it's to keep the Russians engaged and dying for as long as possible. Like they want this war to continue. They're actively preventing efforts at uh, bringing an end to this war, efforts at negotiations uh, and, and, and avenues towards peace. Um, and then they're also openly selling it as this like practice round for Taiwan, for like some sort of showdown where Taiwan is the Ukraine uh, versus China, which I'm sure the China, you know, Chinese leadership sees that and it is quite, you know, alarmed by the idea that the U.S. would want to do the same thing over Taiwan. And then, of course, this is happening at the same time as we're watching uh, the U.S. try to reconfigure NATO as an anti-China alliance, along with being an anti-Russia alliance. I mean, despite the fact that NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And as far as I know, the North Atlantic does not come anywhere near China. Um, but I guess that's besides the point. Um, but, you know, I'm curious if the things I just mentioned, whether it's Ukraine or this threat over Taiwan or this constant, um, like, invoking of NATO becoming an anti-China alliance, has this contributed to China maybe taking a more uh, assertive leadership role on the world, world stage? Yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot to say there. But before I go into that, I just wanted to make one one comment about the Central Asia 
you know, uh, CENTCOM, because because I actually didn't know very much about it until you shared that with me prior to the interview. And it, I like the framing. It's actually called the CENTCOM Area of Responsibility. <laughs> and I think it says a lot just exactly in terms of even how U.S. frames its diplomacy. It doesn't actually really hide. It is the U.S. Area of Responsibility, which include 21 countries. I mean, that that says a lot already how it engages. And we'll, I think they're probably watching quite, um, quite closely because in the next couple of days in Xi here in China, uh, that, that's going to be held the, the China and Central Asia Summit. Um, so we'll probably see some of the important um, uh, agreements that come out of that with some of the key heads of state of Central Asia. But back to sort of NATO, and I, I sometimes joke that I'm like, I think we should, you know, start a nice campaign or a nice slogan that I'd like to make a trademark of is like the North Atlantic out of the Asia Pacific. You know, that would make a nice T-shirt. <laughs> Because oh, yeah. I think you got it just right. <laughs> North Atlantic, <laughs> Asia Pacific, something doesn't fit. I know. <laughs> but <laughs> beyond this, I mean, I think we've been hearing a lot about the, this so-called new Cold War. And it makes us think about, you know, did the, like, did the old Cold War really end, you know? Um, NATO is, an, is really a structure created in the old Cold War era in, in terms of contesting uh, um, the USSR. Um, it should have been dismantled with the fall of the Soviet Union 30 plus years ago. It hasn't. In fact, it has been steadily advancing. Uh, and we've seen that, of course, uh, its role that it's played in the crisis and the war in, in Ukraine. And I don't think it's, this is just an awakening for China. I think it's an awakening for many countries of the global south. You know, when the UN tried, uh, when 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 um, the U.S. tried to push through these uh, unilateral sanctions uh, against Russia or condemnations of Russia, most of the global South countries, and in particular in in Africa, did not go along with it. And I think this has been the role that NATO has played in this war has made has kind of helped awaken a lot of countries in the global South about the real intentions uh, and, and, and also a new non-alignment with the U.S.-led agenda. So I think that's quite interesting. And in this also expansion of NATO into the Asia-Pacific, we've been seeing Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand getting all sucked in to, to this, in addition to the strengthening of other sort of um, uh, uh, institutions like Quad. Um, you know, in Japan, uh, and it was never fully demilitarized from the U.S. presence and has over, I think, something like 50 bases, if I might have to double check that. Uh, and bases are expanding in the region. Of course, with Philippines being the most recent addition, um, it hasn't had an increase in, in U.S. bases since the end of the Cold War, the old one, and now has signed an agreement to have four more U.S. military bases. So if you're China or anyone in the region, you're seeing uh, this, this rise of, of U.S. militarism uh, trying to use, I think, the, the Ukraine war and, and also Russia as a way to also surround uh, China. But I think sometimes uh, in this region, it's, it's really just pushed together a lot of uh, new alliances or strengthened alliances much quicker than we might have anticipated, uh, particularly between uh, Russia and China. And so I think um, one of the things that is really strong now that NATO has made us all realize countries of the global south, is that there is maybe another path uh, that you don't have to just go along with what the U.S. says and that not any enemy of the U.S. is our enemy. And I think that's a good thing for, for in terms of uh, forwarding another path and a path hopefully towards more peace. I'm so glad you raised all that because I think it's a really it's really nice to juxtapose everything you're saying to, to once again going back to the way this is being framed in the U.S. So we talked a little bit about how the sort of military structure is framing China's various maneuvers internationally. And then you have the way the media sort of carries that out in its analysis. This is a piece by The Economist, which, you know, has is known for, for being just like a belligerent, belligerently imperialist outlet uh, historically. Um, and it's titled, for those who are just listening, it's titled The World According to Xi. And then the subheading is, even if China's transactional diplomacy brings some gains, it contains real perils. Um, so be afraid, be afraid. Even if it looks nice what China's doing, it's actually quite frightening. Um, and then you also have this piece uh, that came out back in October. This is in Foreign Affairs. The headline is The World According to Xi Jinping. And the subheading is What China's Ideologue in Chief Really Believes. And then if you go down, like in the beginning, it kind of frames that this is basically all about telling you why what China's doing is actually 
quite bad. And then it kind of spells it out. It's a challenge. It presents a challenge to American power. Um, but anyways, I wanted to get your response to, to that sort of framing, this idea that, you know, China is this actually very, um, you know, transactional country when it comes to foreign policy. And we constantly hear that, whether we're talking about what China's doing in Africa or what China's doing in Latin America. Um, and that's framed in a really negative way. And again, once again, how everything, it, China's not doing it because it benefits China or another country. China's doing it, again, to challenge American power. Is any of that true? <laughs> I mean, I have a couple like voices in my head. No, no, not like in a weird way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one of them I've done that way, in a good way, in a healthy way. <laughs> maybe I don't know. Depends maybe if you voice. follow too much geopolitics, maybe it's not a, not that healthy either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think about this. There's this. Uh, I forgot his name now, but a uh, Kenyan diplomat that had said, you know, every time a, 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 a Chinese ambassador comes, you know, they leave with. Um, you know, we, we get a hospital at the end of that visit. Every time like a British, you know, ambassador comes or a leader comes, we, they leave us with a lecture. So I think, you know, just showing yeah. these two titles says a lot about the perspective. Okay, you can call it transactional, but also many countries in the world are thinking about how to improve the conditions and the material realities of their people. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. 